Okay, everybody, I want to welcome everyone to uh, Networking Protocols and Routing, Chapter 4. Hopefully when we're done this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the functions of the core TCP IP protocols, identify the uh, information, um, and how the information is actually processed as it moves up and down the OSI chain, uh, explain how routers uh, will manage the inter-network communications, Remember, the intern network would be the stuff that's on the inside. Employ various uh, TCP utilities, you know, things for network discovery uh, and troubleshooting and so on. So let's go ahead and get started on this. Uh, remember back in Chapter 1, we learned about that a protocol itself is a rule that governs how computers on a network will exchange data and instructions. Um, my definition has always been uh, a protocol is a rule that governs how data, how data will travel across a network or modem. Okay, in chapter two, you learned about network infrastructure equipment. You learned what a switch was, what a router was, um, what a modem was. And in three, uh, we learned about the data link network and transport and the application layer protocols, um, how they navigate the infrastructure and use various types of addresses as they determine where to send the the in transmitted application data and the instructions. Uh, you also learned about the different tasks that are associated with each layer of the OSI reference model, how data as it, as it, as it goes from point A to point B. If we take a look at, this, at, the, uh, at the graphic we have, and take it something as simple as an email that might be going on, at layer 7, Okay, which is the application layer. Now, it, although, say, like Microsoft Exchange or Outlook, it's, it is an application. It does not reside, actually, on the application layer of the uh, OSI reference. But here at the application layer, this is where a program like SNMP that I mentioned uh, in Chapter 3 uh, port 25. This is where where uh, mail, okay, uses the application layer protocol uh, port number SNMP. This is where IMAP comes into play. So Exchange or Outlook are applications that use those protocols. That all happens in, during the software layers. The software layers are layers five, six, and seven, where the data, um, it's still data no matter what. Nothing, nothing has really been added to the data. All we've really done at this point is we've changed how the data looks. So at the application layer, when you hit send, it sent it out using SNMP. And then it went to the presentation layer, which changed the format of the message. It encrypted the message. It compressed the message. And then it sent it down to the session layer, which then said, I need to open up a layer of communication with another node. The node is going to receive this. Then at the transport layer, layer four, whether it be TCP or UDP, connectionless or connection oriented, okay. Uh, at this layer, it, we added a we added a header, okay. We so we have our data, our encrypted compressed data. Uh, we we add a chunk to it, a header, what we call, and we're saying this is how much data is being sent. It's going to be this many packets. And the data, this is going to be packet one of, of, of packets of 600 packets type of deal. We're going to be uh, opening up a line of communication uh, with synchronizing with the web server in this case. Uh, then we're going to drop it down to the next layer. We're going to say, okay, I need a source which is my address and a destination address, and that's where it's going to go. And then I'm going to drop that down to the data link layer, 
And in order for us to send messages in any communication on the network, we have to have an IP addressing scheme, but we also have to have MAC addressing. So I physically need to know where it's going to go. What is the MAC address of the node is going to receive it? And that's important because as my data travels from point A to point B, I'm going to go through a lot of routers to get from point A to point B. If I'm sending an email from here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to a device in Australia, I'm going to go through a lot of nodes and devices to get there. And the IP address that I'm trying to get to is always going to be the IP address of the network that I'm trying to reach in Australia. But what will change is the MAC address of each device that I have to hit on my way to get there. So I have to add now at the data link layer, I'm going to add the MAC addressing information, but I also at this one here, so I add a header, but I'm also going to add a trailer, which is going to have a lot of my error correction and error detection involved. So I'm going to encapsulate on each end, okay, to really package in all my data. Um, and this is called a frame. So there's like a thousand things inside here. So if remember, a picture itself, they're saying is worth, it's a picture's worth a thousand words. And what do you keep your picture in? You keep your picture in a frame. And so when we get down to the data link layer, I got a thousand things going on in here, and I'm going to package them all in there. So at this point, we are, we are going to uh, add okay, a header and a trail. And we're going to encapsulate that data into a frame. So package it all together, drop it down to the physical layer, turn it all into ones and zeros, and send it along its way. So then what happens is when it gets to the node as it goes across the wire, it's going to get to the data link layer of the next node or, or a node that's going to receive it. Okay. That data link layer is going to look at the MAC address and say, is this my MAC address? And it's going to say, why, yes, yes, it is my MAC address. Cool. You've got mail, right? Then it's going to send it up to the network layer. When it gets to the network layer, if it's just a node that is going that is receiving the the, uh, the data, and it's going to send it on to the next one because it has to go all the way to Australia, it's going to say, ah, this is not my network address, but I know how to get it to that network address. So it's going to repackage those last two layers, the data link layer and the physical layer. It's going to repackage them and say, you need to go to this node. So it's going to change the MAC address, put it back onto the wire, and then send it on, to, on its way until eventually it gets to the receiver in Australia who's going to rip off the data link layer and say, oh, I got mail. This is my MAC address. Cool. And it's going to open up the next layer and say, oh, this is my IP address. Wicked cool, right? Then it's going to send it to the transport layer. The transport layer is going to sit, going to look at all the information saying, is it all here? Okay. It's going to look at those numbers, the, the, the sequence numbers that I get, 667 packets out of 667. If not, I need two packets, whatever. It'll send back for request. If it's all there, it sends it to the session layer. The session layer says, all right, got everything. Transport layer says we're cool. Close the communication line, sends it up to the presentation layer. The presentation layer in the receiving node is the only node that has the capability to decrypt what was done on the, on the uh, source node and decompress it, then sends it up to the application layer. And that's when you get that little ding in your computer that says you got mail. So that's everything that happens right there in a nutshell. And then when it gets, like I said, it, the receiving host will de-encapsulate de, de the message uh, at each layer in reverse order and undo everything that was done on the way. Now, I mentioned something earlier called connection-oriented. Uh, now, what that means, connection-oriented, connection-oriented means it's going to be best effort guaranteed delivery. 
So we're going to have something called a three-way handshake. And what a three-way handshake is, it says it's like a super overly polite conversation. Hey, receiving node, I would like to send you some information. And the receiving node says, awesome. I would like to receive some information. This is how much information I can receive and how fast I can receive it. Because remember, we have to sync up. We have to make sure that we are always communicating on the same speed. And the reason is, is if you think about it, if let's say if you remember like when you were in high school and you were, you were taking a foreign language and you always wanted to speak super slow because it was easier for you to differentiate when one word started and one word stopped. And then also gave your brain an opportunity to translate everything into your native language. Same thing kind of holds true here. If you've got a gig connection, I have a 100 meg connection, I can't speak at 100 gig. I can't listen at 100 gig. So we got to slow everything down to a speed that we can all handle. Then we also have this thing called a window size, which is going to say, uh, I can handle this much data, and then next time, you know, on, on packet number two, I can handle this much data, and that's called a sliding window. And it goes back and forth. But it gives us the ability to keep track of the data that's going through, make sure that it's all there, so we add it all up. And if we remember uh, from, you know, elementary school, these the... Uh, the answer to an addition problem is the sum. So I want to add everything up as it comes through and then check it. I'm going to check some. Okay? And then, as I mentioned earlier, making sure everything is going through at the right speed. That is the flow control. That all happens at that level. Now, if we were to take a look at the segment for TCP, you can see how the data is or how the packet is actually um, set up. So if you look at it, on the bottom of that thing is your data. Look at all the extra stinking information that has to go along. So when you're sitting there and you're saying, hey, I, um, I'm paying for you know, a gig connection and I'm not getting my gig speed. Look at it this way. You might be getting your gig speed. You're just not getting your file, which is a gig in size, in one second. Okay, because you have to take into account that you got all that ex all that extra overhead uh, coming through as well, and plus servers don't send information out at gig speed. So, and a lot to consider when you're when you're complaining about your speeds. You also notice in here that there are you know on the uh, the fourth line down to header length, um, you've got. In, uh, an urgency, so it's a fl these are flags that are saying, okay, this is an urgent packet that we're sending, so you know, give it priority. Uh, this is the acknowledgement number that goes along with the sequencing numbers. Um, am I resetting this? So that, am I saying that I didn't get all the information or something was wrong with it? Um, so I'm going to do a reset. Is this my synchronizational uh, packet that says, okay, I need to... Um, I need to, uh, once again, synchronize up so we can get speeds and everything set up. Or the last one there is this the fin bit. This is the finishing bit, okay? Then you'll see the sliding window size, how much data can I handle at this time. All that information has to be taken into account when we are sending our data. So if we take a look now at what the three-way handshake actually looks like, The three-way handshake starts off with a request for a connection or a synchronization, a request to a response to that request, which is my synchronization acknowledgement. And what's funny is, and a lot of people don't realize it, it's there's actually two different conversations that are occurring here: the the computer A versus computer B. Computer A starts a conversation with a sequencing number. And then computer B 
also sends back an acknowledgement with a sequence number of its own. So there's two conversations, and those numbers, like the, the acknowledgement from computer B will increment by one from, from uh, computer A, but he also sends back a sequencing uh, packet on his own, which will then coincide with the acknowledgement that uh, we get back from on step three. So there's three different messages that are actually going along there. So if we take a look, you'll see this sequence here is coinciding with this acknowledgement, but then computer B also needs to send a synchronization bit, a sequencing bit back, right? So he has this number, which coincides with this guy's acknowledgement, but one, two, three here, okay? And then one, two there. So it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, conversation that's occurring. But if you're thinking to yourself, when will I ever use this? Well, we have this little program we, we use called Wireshark. And we use it to try to troubleshoot and find out what is going wrong with my network. Why aren't my packets coming or flowing properly? Or aren't they all getting here? And you can actually then take a look at your at, your, at the packets that are coming through and then see where they're breaking. Okay? That's connection oriented. But all that extra overhead is what guarantees the delivery of your data. And all that extra overhead takes time. Now for you and I, um, when we're just sending data back and forth or we're just downloading a web page, it doesn't really matter. But when we're doing things like voice over IP or video or a video conference, we can't afford to have all that extra overhead because then we're going to have a buffering stream and we're going to have hiccups in our stream. And that's not going to make for a good quality call. So then we have something called UDP as opposed to TCP. And UDP is our user datagram protocol, but UDP is connection less oriented, which means we don't do a three-way handshake. So that'd be kind of like me um, saying to you, okay, I'm gonna write a message down on a piece of paper, and I'm gonna fold my piece of paper up into a paper airplane, and I'm gonna throw it to you. And if you catch the piece of paper and get the message, awesome. If you missed it, well, you know, I tried. I gave it my best effort. You didn't catch it. I didn't guarantee it was going to get there. There's no error checking. There's no sequencing. There's no flow control in any of this. Okay? That's why we use it for live audio and video streaming, because we can't afford to have that those hiccups during the during the feed. Okay. The packet itself is considerably smaller if we compare that to the TCP the TCP packet, okay? It's just got four extra items in there, and that's it. No huge amount of overhead to go through on that whole, uh, on the whole thing. All we've got in here is uh, source port, destination port, the length, and, of course, the, uh, the checksum, okay? That's just so when it gets there, uh, we, you know, it's a very brief piece of, uh, of information to check just to make sure it all got there. IP is a UDP protocol. IDP or IP is a connection-less protocol. Now, IP operates at the network layer, the OSI reference model. Okay? It specifies where the data needs to go. It identifies the source and the destination IP addresses, not the, not the MAC stuff. Okay, that's a data link layer. We need this in order for our, our routers to be able to handle the information that's coming in. Because routers are only used to get our data from one network to another. It needs TCP to ensure that the messages are put all back together when they get 
when they get to where they belong. That's the whole point of that. IPv6 works very similarly to IP version 4. IPv6, it just, it's just formatted differently in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Uh, it, the packets are bigger. Due to the added information, it carries um, IPv6 uh, uses different packet format than IPv4. The fields in the IPv6 header um, here, okay, as you can see, it's completely different. If you compare the fields and the functions uh, between the IPv4 packets and the IPv6, you'll see that a lot of fields are, are, are missing. Okay. Uh, there are some similarities and there are some differences. So, for example, both packets begin with a 4-bit version field, is it, meaning is it 4 or is it 6. One striking main difference between the two versions is that IPv6 packets accommodate a much longer address. It's 128 bits in length. Also, there's no fragment offset field in IPv6 because IPv6 hosts adjust their packet sizes to fit the requirements of the network before they send the IPv6 messages. So there's no, there's no offsetting to be done there. Which takes now to the ICMP. And we talked about ICMP before. I told you uh, in Chapter 3 that ICMP um, was that response that you have gotten back in the pin. The response that you get back when you do an NS lookup. Uh, that's your ICMP uh, packet. It's a network layer core protocol that reports success or failure delivery. Uh, it doesn't troubleshoot for you. It's just a reporting mechanism. Okay, it might it tells you uh, what part of the network might might have an issue. Okay, uh, it tells you whether or not it got to its destination or not. It doesn't correct the error. It only detects the error. It works the same on IPv4 as it does on IP version six. The main difference is we don't have ARP on IPv6. ARP is an IPv4 function. ARP, Address Resolution Protocol, um, is what uh, we use for IP version 4. You see, I have to, if I have to know your MAC address and I have to know your IP address in order to send you any information uh, for, for, a 30, for a 32 bit packet, then we're going to have, uh, we need to have a mechanism in place in order to uh, learn those items and that's what ARP is used okay it works in conjunction with IPv4 so basically ARP is this I know your I, I know your MAC address I don't know your IP address I'm sorry other way around I know your IP address I don't know your MAC address so I need to send you some information so what I'm going to do is I'm going to scream at everybody on my network and I'm going to say hey everyone if this is your IP address can you do me a favor and respond to this message with your IP address so I can send you a message I got something really important to send you and that happens all the time the problem with that is that's a broadcast you see Broadcasts are not efficient. If I send a broadcast out over my network, that means that I am requiring everybody on the network to shut up and listen while I ask you if this is your IP address. So you might have been trying to have a conversation, but I just sent a broadcast out and told you you need to pay attention to me now. Which is why we only send broadcast through switches. We can't send a broadcast through a router. Could you imagine if I'm trying to send that email out to Australia and I decided, you know what? I'm going to tell the entire world to stop talking while I find out what the IP address is of the node in Australia. That wouldn't go too well. 
So we only do ARPs on our own local network. And what it really is, it's a mapping of, as you can see, IP addresses there on the left to the network card, the MAC address on the network card on the right in that table. An ARC table can contain two types of entries, dynamic and static. Okay, The static address is one that was manually put in. Dynamic is one that was learned. If you open up a command prompt, can you type ARP space dash A? Okay, And that'll tell you, based on your computer's knowledge, those are the mappings of MAC addresses to IP addresses that your computer knows about at this time. The next thing we want to talk about is a little something called Ethernet. Okay, Now Ethernet itself, okay, uh, it's a standard, Okay, it's a data link standard. Okay? A lot of people think Ethernet and they automatically think of IP addressing. Okay, But Ethernet is a data link standard developed by DC, Intel, and Xerox. Okay? before the IEEE uh, be, began to standardize Ethernet itself. So unlike the higher layer protocols, Ethernet adds both the header and a trailer to the payload that it inherits from the layer above it. And now this then creates a frame around the payload. And that details then the Ethernet 2 frame field. Now, if we take a look at the table, okay, um, in the uh, of the uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the the Ethernet frame field um, that was way back on 4-8, let's find that for you. It's not in my not in my slides. So actually, if we look in our books. On the Ethernet, Ethernet frame field, we have a table that would show you the preamble, okay, that's your starting frame, then your start frame delimiter, uh, then you got your header field and your trailer fields, okay. Together, the header and the frame check sequence make up an 18 byte frame around the data. Uh, the data portion of the Ethernet frame might contain anywhere from 46 to 1500 bytes of, trans of information which 1500 becomes what we call the MTU, which is the maximum transmission unit. Uh, it's, uh, it's the largest size in bytes that a router and a message path will allow at the network layer. The default is 1500, but it can be adjusted to whatever it is that you're looking. There are a couple of notable uh, exemptions to Ethernet frame type limitations. Um, one would be VLANs, Ethernet frames on a VLAN, which is a virtual local area network, can have an extra four byte uh, field between the source address and the type field, which is what we're using to then manage the VLAN traffic. Now, if this field exists, maximum frame size would be 1522 bytes. And we'll, lock, we'll talk about uh, VLANs uh, later on. Um, some other special purpose networks use a proprietary version of Ethernet that allows for what's called a jumbo frame, in which the MTU itself uh, can be as high as 9,198 bytes, depending on the type of Ethernet architecture being used. The default Ethernet type that we use today is Ethernet 2. That is, a, that is our default, default that we're using now. So we want to talk about routers now. And as I mentioned earlier, routers, their whole purpose is to connect networks. Routers join two or more networks, and it passes the packets from one network to another. 
So that's why I always want you to think about your home internet. See, you get on your computer and you just naturally assume it's going to work and you're just used to it to, to, to working, but you actually have two networks in your house by default. I'm not talking about your guest network that you might have by default set up with your Google router, your Linksys router, your Netcare router. What I'm talking about is you've got your 192 network or your 10 network that you have, okay? And then on the other side of how it all works, if we were to take a look at it, you have, uh, if we basically take your router and we split it into two, you got the side where your, where your, where your cable comes into the back of your router from Comcast or from Verizon or wherever. That half of your router is the public side, but it's in your house, okay? And then the other half, which has the switch ports where maybe you might plug in or your wireless antenna is, that's the other half of your network. They're literally two different networks. They're two different networks because they have two different IP addressing schemes. So in order for us to pass the IP, the uh, packets from your home IP addressing scheme, whether it be 192 or 10, to the public side of Verizon, maybe be 76 dot something or 50 dot something, whatever, okay? We need to have a, a router in between, and that's what that device is doing in your home. It's passing data from one side to the other side. Now, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of routers out there. You've got your home router, which you have there on the right, then you've got your, your uh, what we would call an integrated service router, which is there in the middle. And then you got your giant ISP router, which is there in the far left. These are the routers that we would, we would find in industry, but they all basically do the same thing. They pass data from one IP addressing scheme to another IP addressing scheme. As I also mentioned earlier, routers don't broadcast. So your switch, which is yelling to everybody to stop talking because it wants to talk, your router's plugged into that switch too. But the router tells the switch, screw you, I'm going to keep on doing my job. Because routers don't stop to send information along. The router will listen to the broadcast because if the router, if the switch is asking for the address of the router, it'll respond to it. But it won't pass that broadcast on through. I could have three switches plugged into each other, and if one, if one node on switch A broadcasts, switch B and switch C will will also send those broadcasts out. It routers have the ability to prevent traffic, they can filter traffic saying, oh, sorry, we don't allow this type of traffic to go through our network. They give, they can give fault tolerance through redundant uh, components such as power supplies. They can monitor and report statistics of your data. They can diagnose internal and other connectivity problems. They can trigger alarms and say, hey, do we have a problem? Come fix me now. Okay, routers are often categorized according to their locations on the network. So, for example, um, like right here, I've got, you know, all three of these routers here can be doing the exact same function. Core router, core router, core router. These guys are out managing my internal network, my autonomous system, auto being one from Latin. Okay, this guy can be doing the same thing, but since he's also communicating to the ISP, He's on the edge of the network too. So he's also an edge router. Okay. Now these routers out here, out in the cloud, what we call these exterior routers, they run different protocols. These guys here are running BGP. These guys here are probably running like OSPF. Okay, which are protocols. Okay. These guys here are very similar to over here. The only difference between this one and this one. There's just one more router, just a little bigger, just a bigger network. But this guy here is on the edge. He's also a core router, but he's on the edge talking to the ISP, so we're going to call him an edge router. Okay. Now, 
internally today, we always used to use routers, but we got some smart switches out there too. Switches typically are relying on doing layer three work. But we got some switches that are doing a little more. And those switches uh, have the ability to do internal routing. So they can send data from network A to network B inside your building. They can do routing, routing functions but they can't take you out to the World Wide Web. But what's nice is they're typically cheaper than a router and faster. They got more ports. A layer four switch has the ability to do all the layer three stuff, the routing, but it can also do a lot more filtering. So they can also act as like a firewall. And those are typically like on the core. Like we have a we have a layer four router or layer four switch in one of our networks here in my office building, and it was a fifty thousand dollar switch. So they're going to go on more of your enterprise networks. Right? Now routers and switches, we we all keep tables. Now it's important to remember that in the IT world, okay, that thing you sit your stuff on is a desk. A table is a list, a list of items, a list of IP addresses. So a router will look at its list and say, oh, I need to know where to send this data. If I don't know where to send it, I send it out, to, I send it here. If I, need, if I know where to send it, I send it here. I know where to send it because I keep a list of all the networks that I'm connected to. That's called my routing table. It's important in our industry that we keep our routing tables as small as possible. The smaller the list, the faster I can read it, the sooner I can send your data on its way. Routing tables can contain the IP address and network masks that identify a network that a host or another router may belong to that i got to send the information out to. See, router C knows about the nodes that are attached to its LAN on LAN C. Router C also knows about knows about the nodes that are attached to it on LAN D. It does not know about the nodes on, on LAN B or LAN A, but it knows how to get to those networks. And if if switch C needs something on LAN A, it knows to go to router C. Router C knows not to send it to B, but to send it to A. It also knows that if someone on LAN C needs something on the internet, that it needs to send it the data to route B, to router B, and then send it out to the internet, because router B has told everybody that he's the edge router, and he, you need to send it to him. Two types of routing, as always, we can put our information in manually, and we do that if the routes are never going to change. Put them in there, and then it takes off, takes away a lot of the overhead. We do dynamic routing if information on our network map, on our area of the network that we want to monitor, if that typically changes, we're going to use some dynamic routing. We're going to say, you know what, I need to, this this LAN D over here is connected to LAN E and LAN F, and I need to know about them, and those nodes change quite frequently, so I want to be able to learn about them if they start adding information. But, unlike this guy here, router C knows that router A is connected to, to LAN A and router B. So I'm just gonna, he's just gonna, router A is just gonna say, these are my three static addresses, they're never gonna change, that's good to me, that's good to go. Router C is gonna say that this address here is a router B address, this is a router C address, this is a router A address, this is a router C, uh, uh, router D address here, so therefore, I'll statically assign these. But if there's more information going on passed over here, I might need to know about it, and I might want to make that dynamic. Okay? The route command allows you to view a host routing table. So yeah, your devices themselves do have, um, 
do have dynamic tables as well. Uh, you can run a route command or a route print command on a Windows system. Uh, on our Cisco devices, because well, you're going to be working on Cisco devices here, uh, in Packet Tracer, so you are going to use the show IP route command. Show IP route command is one of the most common troubleshooting commands that I do on a router when I'm trying to figure out um, if I'm running a dynamic routing protocol. And I'm like, okay, do I know about that other network yet? I can't ping it. Show IP route. Nope. The routing protocol is not working. To show IP route, I don't know about router, router A and router B's networks. So... I'm going to need to, to do that. So what I mean by that, so let's say these guys here are running something called OSPF. Now that's a routing protocol, so that I'll learn about things dynamically, okay? So what I do is I plug in just the route, this guy right here, this address of this interface right here, and that, that would be um, is all I need to know about router B. So router C knows about this address and this address. Router C does not know about this one, this one, or this one. Router A is going to tell me about them. And I'm going to tell router B about, router, about, about this network here. They'll be dynamically learned. Okay? So I just plug in the information about the routers I'm directly connected to and show IP route would would, would give me that information, and then I would say, okay, now I know my network is working properly. Now, routers, they don't always know the best path to take. Like, when you're driving somewhere far away, you might say, okay, I need to, you know, I'll, you have a, a map, you'll say, I'm going to go this way, this way, this way, and this way. But then, have you ever noticed sometimes if you're doing something with Google Maps, it doesn't always take you the same way? And that's because it uses different metrics. It might use uh, congestion on the highways, speed traps, speed limits, road con road construction, all of that to make a determination on what, or, or even toll roads, to what's the, how am I going to get from point A to point B the most efficient way? And the routers do the exact same thing. They'll use routing metrics. Now, those routing metrics, okay, now, these are properties of a route used by routers to determine the best path. Okay, hop count. How many routers am I going through? Okay, bandwidth. Is it a hundred meg? Is it ten meg? Is it gig? Delay or latency. What's going on? Is there a lot of traffic out here? Is there, you know, am I am I sending too much data down this path? Can this router handle? The larger size maximum transmission unit or the smaller? Okay. What is the routing cost or a value assigned to a particular route? Can I trust the route? What is the protocol being used on the route? Do I trust it? What's the topology like of this network? All that comes into play when your routing, when your router makes a decision on what path it's going to take to get from point A to point B. It's really quite impressive. The protocols that we use on our routers to communicate with each other to determine the best path. One of the one of the protocols that, that you know even Cisco still teaches us to use is RIP, the routing information protocol. Nobody programs with that anymore. It's inefficient. Doesn't take into account all the different metrics and it has a maximum hop count of of 15. It also feels the need to talk to the neighboring routers every 30 seconds. Very inefficient. Even even if even if they have nothing to say to each other. It's going to say, "Hey, I'm connected to router uh, D and A and B." And 30 seconds later it's going to say, "Hey, I'm connected to routers D, A and B." Very inefficient. Routers rate the reliability and priority of a route routing protocol's data based on criteria, and that criteria is the administrative distance. Now, of course, certain protocols are going to be uh, valued better than others. The lower the administrative number, the more reliable the, the route. 
So for example, in the scenario we had before, where router C was connected to router B, it was directly connected, it had an administrative distance of zero. Can't get much lower than zero. Definitely it's going to trust that route. I'm directly connected to it. But it might say, okay, this is OSPF, and you have an administrative distance of 110. Then it'll say, uh, this guy here is using EIGRP, which is the Cisco proprietary protocol, and I'm a Cisco router, so now my administrative distance is going to be 100. So that's a big, that's a big uh, clincher when it comes to determining who's going to be the better a better uh, path to take. Overhead, obviously, is always going to have uh, come into play as well. Now, if we take a look, we have different words that are timed on the far right of this table, distance vector and link state. A distance vector protocol is um, not as efficient. It takes into a large account how many routers I have to go through. So if I have to go through three routers, but they're all gig speed routers, okay, um, or they're all 10 meg routers, they, it might seem like a better path to take, but it might be a slower path. I'd be like, I have to drive, I have to drive 10 miles down the road. If I take this route, I'm going to go 10 miles, but the speed limit's 35 miles an hour. But if I take this route, I have to go 12 miles, but the speed limit's 65. And has no stop signs. You know, stuff like that. Um, so link state uh, algorithms or routers, link state routers draw a map. It's wicked cool. So you think about it. I've got all these routers in this area that I'm that I'm looking at, and I'm going to talk to router D. Router D is going to talk to router E. Router E is going to talk to router F. F's going to talk to G. Okay, and then together we're going to all draw this giant map of the network. So when I'm sitting here on router C talking to D. I have the exact same knowledge of the network that he does, and that F does, and that G does, and that H does. I have all the same knowledge, because we're all linked together. The problem with a link state algorithm, let's say somebody all the way on, route, on network I has a change in the network. That doesn't mean a node went down. I mean, we actually had a break in the network itself. I is going to tell H. H is going to tell G, and so on, all the way back down. So we all got to start reprocessing and rebuilding our maps. That's the big thing about link state. But in reality, these things really don't go down that much. So it's a pretty efficient way to do things. Now, if you look at the EIGRP there, EIGRP is a Cisco routing protocol, they call it an advanced distance vector because it's really it's a link state and a distance vector all in one. It's proprietary. Now, Cisco has released a uh, version of EIGRP to play nice with all different vendors. So it can work with uh, other types of routers as well. BGP, is an exterior gateway protocol, that was the one that was at, in between those autonomous systems that we saw earlier, it's the one that the ISP uses. BGP is the only, it is the de facto uh, protocol of the internet. So it's the only one that's currently in use. That's all you really know, need to know about that one with EGP. Okay. OSPF, open shortest path first, one of the, mo one of the more common uh, link state protocols that we use used on large networks, low overhead, it is stable. You can use it on multi-routers. ISIS, it's not ISIS, folks. ISIS, it's an IGP and link state routing protocol. Not as, um, it's not used as much. It is extremely scalable. But a lot of, our, a lot of your Cisco engineers will be using uh, OSPF. 
EIGRP, um, often referred to as a hybrid protocol because it does it does both fast time convergence. That means it doesn't take as long for all the networks to know about each other. It's easier to configure, uh, less CPU intensive than OSPF. Uh, it supports multiple protocols, limits unnecessary uh, network traffic between your routers. And I mentioned earlier, BGP is the guy that goes out on the internet. Okay. TCP/IP comes with a whole bunch of utilities. We already talked about a number of them. Um, it helps you find out what's going on, okay? You should be familiar with the tools and the parameters that they're all using, which is important, okay? One of them is NetStat. You use that on your Windows machine, okay? Gives you the information about all the network statistics that are going on on your computer, so you can find out just exactly everyone that your computer knows about, right? Comes with a whole bunch of uh, arguments that we can put on them. NetStat-N, current connections, including the IP addresses and the ports that are open. Okay, dash F, this current connections including IP addresses, ports, and the fully qualified domain name. That's a good one there. Okay. And you can read the rest of those, and they're all in your book as well. Okay. Trace RT and Trace Route. Uh, personally, I'm not a huge fan of, um, of the Trace RT. Um, I'd sooner ping, but... You can only ping an address that you know about, so trace route will actually tell you the other addresses. It just takes a long time to run trace trace RT. Uh, Linux, however, trace route. I wish Windows was as efficient. You can run a trace route um, on a Linux box, and it'll run the command in a literal fraction of the time that trace RT will do it. How are you going to remember the um, the uh, diff, the uh, the commands well the way I do it trace RT is the Windows command RT was the first version of the Microsoft Surface that Windows came out with it was the retail version and if you think about it everything that Microsoft does is about money in Linux it's free so trace route uh, now just a graphic of the trace route tool and what actually happens Literally, what, what happens when we trace route, it just tends to ping out to each destination between, or each node, a route, router in between point A and point B, and responds back and then tells you where the, where the link might be down. Path ping, not a big fan. It basically, it's, it's trace route for, um, for Windows uh, just by showing you the ping. That's all. TCP dump. Free command line packet sniffer it's for Linux in, uh, in, in uh, Unix commands. Captures traffic across the network. Okay, save the output to a file or you can play it back later on. Okay, you got to do a sudo command to do it. Basically, you're switching the user to do the um, to do an administrative command. Okay, and then there's some common commands for TCP dump. I don't uh, typically use it. And I'm also but not a big guy in using a uh, a dig as well. There's some other command line utilities for you guys to brush up on and get familiar with. We've already spoken about a lot of them. Uh, another problem you might have is duplicate MAC addressing. As I said earlier um, in Chapter 3, uh, you can spoof a MAC address. Uh, you can clone a MAC address. Um, if someone spoofs your address, that means they're inter they can have the ability to intercept your data packets, and if they're intercepting your data packets, they're getting them, and you are not. So it is a security risk. Okay. Um, other routing problems you might run into, well, things, things break, folks. Uh, that's why on Cisco uh, devices, we, we usually purchase something to go along with our Cisco devices called SmartNet, uh, which means even if our router is no longer uh, considered uh, valid. It's reached its end of life, but we still keep our SmartNet contracts up. That means Cisco will either have to replace our router if it breaks or keep one on hand or upgrade us. Ping is probably the most common tool we use. So your ICMP messages 
will always help you out the most. Okay. And that concludes our Chapter 4 uh, lesson. I uh, hope it was as good for you as it was for me. And I will see you guys back here for Chapter 5.